Hello, everybody. My name is Adriana, and I'm one of the organizers of the Teens Neuroscience Seminar Series. I would like to welcome all of you here online, and thank you for your interest in our seminar. We have around 100 people registered for this talk, so we're still waiting for everybody to gather up. Uh, I would like to tell you a few words about the, the seminar series. The Teens Neuroscience Seminar Series was born at an, as an initiative uh, of researchers in Teens, which is the Transylvanian Institute of Neuroscience, a research institute in Cluj-Napoca, Romania. We here at Teens feel that neuroscience is still poorly represented in many countries and therefore deserves more coverage here in Romania and why not worldwide. We aim to bring neuroscience closer to those who share our passion for it, whether they work in this field or not, and inspire them to become more curious in matters of the brain. We will hold free online seminars periodically, once or twice every month, with a wide, vari wide variety of speakers from all corners of neuroscience. Uh, the format for today will be a five-minute intro, followed by a 40-minute talk, and then a 15-minute uh, Q&A section. Uh, please, we encourage you strongly to post any questions you might have in the Q&A panel of Zoom, which should appear if you hover the mouse on the bottom of your screen. Uh, please feel free to upvote or comment on existing questions. And in the, at the end, in the Q&A section, we will select the interesting questions for Katarina to answer. The chat is also open for discussion, but please select all audience from the drop-down panel to see, to, for everybody to see all your comments. I will now give the word to Raul Mureshan, which is the director of the Transylvanian Institute of Neuroscience in Cluj, and he will be our moderator for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adriana. Uh, thank you, Katarina, for accepting to give this exciting talk. So first of all, uh, I would like to introduce Katarina. She started her studies in Berlin, aiming initially to become a medical doctor, but soon she shifted her passion towards research and she wrote her doctoral thesis at the Department of Psychiatry at the Charité in Berlin. She then completed her medical training, specializing in psychiatry and gained a unique perspective on neuronal maladies uh, by working with patients. After undertaking a postdoc in Berlin, alongside her residency, she pursued a research fellowship at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in New York in Adam Kepech's lab, where she set up a mouse model of hallucination, which would serve as a tool for her future research. Currently, Katarina is leading a group at the Francis Crick Institute in UK, where she develops new approaches combining behavioral observations and computational models to study psychosis in humans and in mice. She aims to better understand the process that generates perception and thoughts and to identify biological targets for schizophrenia and other neuronal disorders. So I think uh, her talk will be very, very interesting for us because um, we can only understand the, how the normal, how the healthy brain functions if we also understand the disorders that plague it, and especially some of these phenomena like uh, hallucinations. So Katarina, you have the floor. Thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction and for the invitation. Let me share my screen. All right, yes, um, so as Raul already mentioned, I am a psychiatrist and I am interested in psychosis. And the reason I am interested in psychosis is that psychosis is characterized by these very, very interesting phenomena, such as hallucinations and delusions. And these phenomena are basically perceptions of something non-existent. In the case of hallucinations, people typically hear voices where other people can't hear any voices. In the case of delusions, people typically see threats where others can see any threat. And to me, this really illustrates the constructive nature of our perception. And therefore, studying psychosis can, I believe, really generate some fundamental insights into how we perceive the world in general. But of course, psychosis is not only very fascinating, it's also highly relevant. Um, it is the hallmark of many severe brain disorders such as schizophrenia that are relatively frequent with a lifetime prevalence of up to 1%. And what makes these disorders so devastating is that they start early in life and more often than not, they do not fully resolve. And unfortunately, this has not dramatically changed over the past 50 years. Treatment has somewhat stagnated. Um, the medications we have are all based on mechanism of actions 
actions that were discovered by serendipity back in the 50s, and we still do not know how and why the neural circuitry in the brain gets affected to produce the symptoms of psychosis. And this frustration really drove me from psychiatry into neuroscience, because in neuroscience, there has been a lot of progress. And we have now tools at our hands, and I will showcase some of these tools in this talk, that allow us to study neural circuits and behavior in amazing resolution. However, to make use of these tools, we need to find ways of studying psychosis in mice because that's where we have all these tools. And this is the overarching theme of my uh, research um, to develop new ways to study psychosis in mice and use them to dissect disease mechanisms that can then eventually guide future treatment. There are two major challenges in psychosis research. The first challenge is that it is somewhat difficult to measure psychosis in uh, rodents where we have all these tools. And that is because psychosis is exclusively characterized by these very subjective sy symptoms um, that are just hard to objectively measure. And uh, today I will introduce a new framework of hallucination-like perception that actually allows us to objectively capture some of the processes that are involved in these very subjective experiences. And the other big challenge that we have is that even if we can measure psychosis across uh, species, it is still difficult to then induce psychosis in rodents in a way that actually reflects the uh, state that patients with psychosis are in. And so at the end of my talk, I will just talk a little bit about our ongoing research where we try to use insights into the immune system to get mice into a state where they uh, are experiencing psychosis. Okay, so how can we measure psychosis in rodents? And I've been interested in this question for quite a while now. Um, so when I was a postdoc in Berlin at the Charité, I uh, already was fascinated by this question, how can we measure something so subjective as perception and as false perception um, and thought and false thoughts in an objective way? And at that time, many people um, thought about psychosis and schizophrenia from a more cognitive perspective and um, thought about wrong inferences or working memory deficits that might lead to these, um, uh, or jumping to conclusions that might lead to these uh, yeah, experiences uh, in psychosis. But some researchers, including ourselves, we had the uh, insight that maybe because psychosis is so perceptual in nature, it might be best viewed as a perceptual disorder. And we started out to test this idea and um, recruited people with psychosis and healthy individuals and did some very basic uh, perception experiments um, that we could uh, analyze in detail with computational models and combined that with some um, functional neuroimaging and some pattern analysis via machine learning. And what we found again and again, and this is just one exemplary finding, is that psychotic experiences here at the x-axis um, correlated and predicted these perceptual, um, these perceptual phenotypes um, that we could measure at the behavioral level um, here at the left, but also at the level of neural processing. So what this suggested to me is that maybe these perceptual phenotypes might provide a window, window into translating um, between mice and humans. And so I was very excited when um, Adam Cabbage in Cold Spring Harbor, New York, invited me to join his lab because his lab and others uh, at Cold Spring Harbor had really pioneered the use of these perceptual tasks in rodents. And together we set out to model hallucinations in mice. And we started out with a very simple, basic definition of hallucinations. So if we look at what a hallucination is, it's basically a false perception that is made in the absence of a causative or correlative stimulus. But not only that, it is also experienced with high certainty or confidence. And we thought that this is something that we can model in a mouse. And here is the task we came up with. So in this task, mice are freely moving um, in a box and there are three little uh, holes that have little spouts in it. Um, and so now whenever the mouse pokes into the center of these three holes, we play a brief tone signal. And that now signals to the mouse that it has to go to the right to get a water reward here. 
if it goes to the left, it doesn't get a reward. And this is half of the trial, trials. Randomly interspersed is another type of trials where the mouse pokes into the center, but now we do not play a tone. And now the mouse has to go to the left to get a water reward. If it goes to the right, it doesn't get a water reward. So this gives us the perceptual choice, um, the percept. Now, how do we measure confidence? And to do that, we used a trick. And that trick is that we don't give the reward right away, but we delay it for an unpredictable interval of time. And sometimes we just don't give them a reward, even if they are correct. And this now has the effect that the mice never know whether and when um, to expect them a reward. And so they have to make a decision how much time they are willing to invest. And the simple intuition here is if they are very confident that they actually were correct, um, for example, that they actually did hear a tone or did not hear a tone, they will invest more time and wait for longer times before uh, uh, poking out and initiating a new trial. So in this framework or in this task, we can define hallucination-like perception as false alarms. That means trials where we do not play a tone, but the mice nevertheless report hearing the tone. And they do so with high confidence as indicated by a long time investment. So the first question we had to answer is, can mice actually do this task? And we were lucky because with enough training, mice get actually pretty good at this task. So what I'm showing you here is a psychometric curve. So on the x-axis is um, the signal to noise ratio, or in other words, the volume of the tone um, over uh, constant background noise. And on the y-axis is the percentage of signal choices. That means the percentage of trials where the mice indicated that they did hear the tone. And I hope what you can appreciate is that when the tone was very loud, mice actually very often, uh, almost always, correctly reported hearing the tone as the volume of the tone um, got, uh, got softer, um, this percentage decreased. And now most importantly, even if we did not play a tone at all, my still reported hearing tones on a substantial proportion of trials around 15%, which is good news because these are the false alarms we are after. This is the first part of our definition of hallucination-like perception. So that was very uh, reassuring. Now, their choices uh, reflected this kind of um, signal to noise ratio, suggesting that they actually indicated what they were perceiving. Now, the, um, what about their confidence? And to know whether some behavioral measure is a good measure of confidence or not, we first need to have a good principled idea what confidence should look like. And for this, we, we um, occurred to a mathematical model of statistical decision confidence, which simply is a model that says that confidence should reflect the probability of being correct. And because the probability is kind of fairly easy to compute in uh, mathematical terms, we um, can do that. And when we do that, we can plot what we get. We can plot this probability. And this is what I'm showing you here. So this is the probability of being correct plotted in three different ways. Now, what we can do, we can then overlay the actually observed time investments that the mice had uh, on top of that. And I hope that you can appreciate that it looks fairly similar. So suggesting that the time investments were well predicted by these um, statistical decision confidence or the probability of being correct. And um, what I just showed you was for one mouse, but we actually saw um, similar effects in all eight mice that we tested. So what this suggests is that the reported time investments did reflect statistical confidence, making us confident in turn that we could actually measure confidence in our minds. So we have a half a task and we can measure perception and confidence associated with perception. We um, of course thought about, about other alternatives that might explain our behavior. Um, and we looked at a few things. So for example, we thought maybe um, mice do not really report their perception, but maybe their, their false alarms are just a motor bias. Maybe the mice just have a bias towards going more to the left or to the right. Um, but we found that this was not the case. So regardless of whether we trained mice to go to the left or to the right to report a signal, um, the psychometric curves looked um, very similar. And we also don't think that these false alarms are just mere errors. And that is because um, on these easy signal trials, when the tone was very loud, mice were almost always 100% uh, correct. Um, that means they were able to do the task quite well. 
Um, so there's not, it's not an explanation that they were just inattentive or something, and that's why they had um, these false alarms. Um, and one thing that is also very important to understand, these false alarms cannot be explained by reward-related behavior. And that is because um, our task was balanced. So both, false, both basically signal trials and no signal trials had the same probability of reward. And by design, um, reporting false alarms would decrease the reward the animals would get. Um, and that is also shown here just empirically that indeed, um, the more uh, false alarms the mice had, the more false, uh, the less reward they got. Um, so their false alarms are not explained by mice trying to optimizing the or maximizing the reward they get. Um, it's not probably inattention, so we don't see any correlation with other measures of attention. And um, finally, um, we don't think that it is um, it is fatigue um, because it, the false alarm rates are constant throughout the the session. Um, and also, we don't think that all the false alarms are just like completely um, driven by some uncertainty the mice are experiencing. And the reason why we are thinking that is if we look at the time investments as a measure of confidence, we see that although on average the time investments for the false alarms are lower than for the hits, there's quite a substantial overlap suggesting that if some trials, um, so all this, these overlapping trials, were perceived with the same confidence as the trials where mice correctly um, reported the tone. Okay, so we have a task where we can measure um, confidently what we call hallucination-like perception. Now, the thing is, just because we call it hallucination-like perception, that does not mean that it has to do anything with real hallucination. So next, we wanted to find out, um, is that does our task engage some of the processes that we think are engaged in hallucination? And the first thing we did um, is we, um, based on an observation in humans with hallucinations, and that observation is that people with hallucinations rely more strongly on perceptual expectations during this kind of task. So we thought, okay, if our measure is a good measure uh, or captures something about hallucinations, it should increase with increasing expectations. And so to model expectations, we had a version of the task where um, we basically had different blocks, and in each of these blocks, we varied the amount of trials with, uh, that contained signals from very low to 50% to 70%, with the idea that if uh, the more trials with uh, signals there were, the higher the expectation of the mice um, was to actually hear a tone. And what we observed was exactly that, that with increasing expectations, mice um, reported more false alarms. And they also reported uh, being more confident in these false alarms. And um, what was really nice, this was kind of driven by a bias in perception, meaning that they did not, um, it did not affect um, errors here on the easy trials, but we really saw that the strongest effect were um, on the trials, um, on the false alarm, and here these difficult um, signal trials, suggesting that mice just started to perceive more signals in general when they were expecting more signals. So what this shows is that one manipulation that we know to be associated with hallucinations in humans induced more hallucination-like perceptions in mice, suggesting that maybe our task does engage some of the processes that are important for hallucination. The next thing we did was based on a similar observation, although slightly different. Um, and that observation is that ketamine in humans at low doses can induce a state that is similar to psychosis. Um, and so we just treated our mice with low dose ketamine or with vehicle. And we saw that indeed, with in, um, uh, that ketamine increased false alarm rate and also false alarm confidence. And what is really important here again is that this was not explained by mice making more errors, which is kind of remarkable. This is actually, I would have expected that mice under ketamine would just become erratic in general and just make more errors, but that's not what we saw. As you can see here, what we observed was that mice um, under ketamine had a spe fairly specific bias in perception and just started to perceive more signals in general. And the effect was strongest here on the no signal trials where they then had more false alarms. So what this shows is that another manipulation known to be related to psychosis in humans induces hallucination-like or increases hallucination-like perception in mice, again, suggesting that maybe our task engages some of the processes relevant for hallucinations. But of course, to know whether something really is a good measure of hallucinations or not, ideally, we want to directly correlate it to hallucinations. And because we cannot ask our mice whether they hallucinate or not, 
we translated our task back into humans. This is the human version of the task. It's very um, similar to the mouse version. So we play tones or don't play tones. And then we uh, people report via button presses whether they hear a tone or not and report their confidence now just by directly indicating their confidence and get reward. And um, what we found was um, that indeed, if we look at their behavior, um, the, the human behavior, although it, the curve looked different, but in principle, um, we saw a similar relationship between signal to noise ratio and the signal um, choice. Also very remarkable, humans did not have a lot of errors, um, which is remarkable because we tested online participants that were just randomly selected from enter. So uh, I was quite surprised to see this uh, high data quality. I would have expected that many more of them would just report anything, but you can see here that um, on average, their performance was quite good. And also they um, had quite some false alarms, although it looks very small here, but they did have on average 7% of false alarms. Um, so that was um, kind of good news. And also what was uh, quite surprising to me is that their confidence rating followed very closely our confidence model, at least in the majority of participants. Again, as you can see here in all of these humans, um, the confidence model, the statistical confidence predicted their very subjective confidence ratings quite well. So, um, this is just to show that our human task was able to measure perception and confidence um, in a similar way than in mice. Now, how did we relate it to hallucinations? And for that, we um, followed the idea that hallucinations are actually not confined to pathological states, but um, occur on a continuum. And um, surprisingly, in the general population, there are quite a few people who regularly have hallucinations. And there are questioners out there that are able to capture that. They ask questions like, do you ever hear noises or sounds when there's nothing about to explain them? And then people have to say yes or no and have also to, also have to rate their distress and their um, how, how often they think about it and whether they believe it's true or not. Um, and what previous studies have shown quite interestingly is that um, these questionnaires um, show a big variation of hallucination-like experiences in the general population. So here in the uh, dark gray are uh, psychosis in patients. So, um, and you can see that even in them, there's quite a big spread of hallucination experiences. Um, but now in the general population, you can see although the distribution is kind of um, biased towards people who don't have a lot of hallucination, you can see that there are quite some that do have a lot of hallucinations here at the end. And actually the spread is like exactly the same as in the, uh, in the psychosis inpatient group, although the shape is different. And so we found exactly, we could reproduce the shape. So we also found that people had this variation in their hallucination-like perception. And now when we related this variation to, our, to the behavior that we had observed in the task, we could observe that self-reported hallucinations did predict our um, task behavior on hallucination-like perception. So what I'm showing you here is on the x-axis is the questionnaire score for hallucinations. And on the y-axis is the false alarm rate and the false alarm confidence in the task. And you can see that there's a positive correlation. So the more um, hallucinations people reported for in their daily life, the more false alarms and the more confident they were in these false alarms um, in the task. And what was really interesting was that when we looked at other dimensions of pathophysiology, for example, um, anxiety or depression, we found that hallucinations alone explained this task behavior best suggesting that there's at least some degree of specificity to hallucinations. Okay, this was a lot of data. And just to recap, I introduced this new framework of hallucination-like perception to measure psychosis across species. And I showed you that mice can actually um, report hallucination-like perception. I showed you that hallucination-like perception increases after hallucinogenic manipulations in mice and correlates with self-reported hallucinations in humans. So taken together, this suggested that our measure of hallucination like perception might capture some processes relevant for hallucinations. And with that confidence, we now went to dig into the neural circuit mechanisms. And we started off with do dopamine um, because dopamine is uh, one of, is a good starting point because it is known or one of the leading hypotheses for psychosis is that it is caused or uh, um, accompanied by an increase in striatal dopamine release. And the evidence for this is that all the antipsychotic drugs that 
we know work against psychosis do target dopamine receptors. And also we know from imaging studies that people with psychosis show an increased dopamine turnover in their striatum. However, what we do not know is why too much dopamine should lead to these false perceptions uh, in the form of hallucinations. And that is because we know a lot about dopamine. Um, and for example, in the context of reward processing, of movement, of cognition, but we don't know a lot of, um, about dopamine in the context of perception. And now we have a framework to actually address this question. But before we went all crazy and measured and manipulated dopamine, we first wanted to, to be on kind of a good theoretical grounding. So we first wanted to know what should we actually look for? What should neural activity look like at any given time point? And for this reason, a very good way is um, computational models. Um, I call it psychophysics with memory. It's basically a way to make some predictions on what some uh, internal variables should look like at any given time point. And the model we came up with is this belief updating model that has a Bayesian, um, it's based on the idea of Bayesian inference. And this idea is that perception in, um, relies both on the sensory input that can be represented here as a likelihood and um, on the on prior expectations that can be represented here as a prior distribution. And we know, um, so these two then can then be combined into a posterior and that posterior then gives rise to a percept. Um, and now this percept um, will have a certain confidence attached to it. And now at some point, the mouse or the agent will get some feedback whether the percept was correct or not. And this model assumes that this will generate that the difference between the confidence and the actual feedback will generate an error signal, a prediction error. And this prediction error will now update the signal prior and drive learning in a way that at the next trial, then um, the agent will expect um, a signal that is uh, kind of would minimize the prediction error on that trial. And so um, what we first did with this model is to see whether it can actually do the task, whether it can behave as our mice. And the good news is that yes, it can. So here um, on the left side is the model behavior, on the right side is the mouse behavior, and this is showing the choice and the confidence. And I hope you can appreciate that it looks very similar. Um, the model also recapitulates the expectation effect when we give it a task with different uh, blocks, with different signal proportions, it does um, increase uh, false alarms and false alarm confidence in response to these different blocks. And finally, we see something very nice, which um, we call trial by trial updating. Um, and Basically, what this is, is we, we know from that mice and humans and all uh, other species, they actually, even in a task like ours, where the last trial should actually not influence the, the current trial, because there's no correlation between the two. But what we do see that is that we there are some influences from the last trial on the current trial. So, um, for example, a mouse is more likely to repeat a choice um, if it was correct. And that, interestingly, depends on the difficulty of the last trial. So the more difficult the last trial was, the more likely it is to repeat the choice. And that is perfectly captured by our model here, um, which makes sense because if the mouse was not very, conf uh, if the trial was very difficult, um, then the confidence of the mouse was very low. If, um, so if it then was correct, the prediction error was very high and that would lead to a stronger effect on the next trial. And this is just to show you here that um, that's exactly what we see in the model. So now we have a model that can do the task and Interestingly, it makes two very um, yeah, precise predictions of how um, the model or dopamine could lead to hallucination-like perception. So one possibility is that dopamine might code um, some reward expectations. Um, and in that case, because reward is balanced in the task, so um, expectations about reward are actually not helpful. Um, so in that case, the model would lead to an increase of errors in general. So both um, false alarms and misses, and also the confidence in these. And this is how hallucination-like perception would arise. An alternative way for dopamine in this framework to lead to hallucinations is that dopamine might encode signal expectations. So basically the expectation about hearing a signal. And in that case, increases in dopamine would lead to more signal perceptions, um, both for correct and incorrect signal perceptions, and that would lead to more false alarms and more hits and also a higher confidence in these. 
Okay, so with these theoretical predictions, we knew what to look for. And um, we went right into the brain and measured dopamine. And for this, we took advantage of this uh, really cool tool, these dopamine sensors. So these are proteins that we can express in the brain of mice using a virus. So we inject a virus and the virus leads to the expression of this protein. And these proteins are engineered in a way that whenever dopamine binds to them, they emit fluorescence. So what we can then do is we can implant a glass fiber on top of the area that we are interested in and where we have injected this uh, protein. And what we can then see is um, light that is being emitted. And this light intensity fluctuates with the levels of dopamine. And we did this in two different regions. Um, one is the ventral striatum, which is a region that is known to be involved in reward processing. This was motivated by our first prediction that dopamine might encode reward um, expectations. And the other region is the tail of the striatum that it's not as established as the ventral striatum, but there is some evidence suggesting that this region might be important for perception because it receives very dense inputs from auditory cortex and also uh, from visual cortex. So, we first wanted to check whether our dopamine measures worked. Um, and so we first, what we first looked for was what, what could we observe um, when, um, in, how did dopamine behave in response to the stimulus? And we saw very similar things in the ventral stratum and in the tail of the stratum. And what we saw was that um, when we played the stimulus, dopamine phasically increased. Um, and this was, uh, these increases were larger if the stimulus was louder. Um, and again, very similar in both of these regions. Now, when we then looked for the reward responses, we saw um, also a very um, steep phasic response, which is not surprising that has been described for dopamine in the striatum. Um, and interestingly, these reward responses were inversely related to the volume of the signal in the beginning. And that kind of makes fits nicely with this idea of reward prediction error where um, a stimulus, a cue that predicts reward with high probability, such as, for example, a very loud signal where it's very clear what the mouth has to do, um, leads to larger responses, but then also, um, and the reward then is more predicted, and that is why it leads to lower response. In any case, what this shows is basically our dopamine responses make sense. Um, we are confident that we are measuring what we think we are measuring. Um, now, of course, what we were most interested in, how does dopamine relate to false alarms? And for that, we compared false alarms and correct test. And here we saw something quite surprising. And the surprising observation we made was when we aligned these dopamine traces to the stimulus, what we found was that even before the stimulus was played, dopamine was kind of shifted, was increased as compared to trials where, um, so was increased before false alarms as compared to trials where the mouse would correctly uh, report not hearing the tone. So dopamine was predictive of the future behavior of the mice. In, um, and this is an example from one mouse. But we saw very consistent um, effects in all mice we tested. And more remarkably, when we now divided the trials into low confidence trials, so just errors, and high confidence false alarms, which are the real hallucination-like perceptions, we saw that dopamine was particularly high before a mouse would have such a hallucination-like perception. And this is just to show that there was even a linear relationship. So here on the x-axis is dopamine. On the y-axis is um, the, false the high confidence false alarm rate, so the rate, the probability of pr reporting a hallucination-like perception. And you can see that um, if dopamine was low at the beginning of the trial, this probability was low. But if dopamine was high at the beginning of the trial, this probability was quite high. Um, and again, this was very similar in both of these regions. Um, now, when we went in more depth using our model um, and the insights from our model, we saw a very interesting dissociation. And this is a very busy slide, and, and it's not important to understand all the details, but um, just please focus on the pattern that we can observe here. So here, what I'm plotting here is the dopamine from the ventral um, striatum, the dopamine baseline, so the, the dopamine levels at the beginning of the trial, um, in different uh, ways, basically, uh, just for all trials, uh, for all different trials separated. And what you can see, hopefully, is that the ventral stratum looks very similar to the reward expectation that we generated from the model, suggesting that maybe dopamine in the ventral stratum does encode these reward expectations 
expectations, and that is why it relates to hallucination-like perception. In the tail of the stratum, in contrast, we saw that dopamine, as shown here, looked very similar to the signal expectation from the model. So in other words, dopamine here um, behaved as if it was telling um, the animal something about whether it would now hear a signal or not in the next trial. And so that might explain why more dopamine would then lead to hallucination-like perception. So this is all nice, but it's all correlative. So this is just correlating um, dopamine activity in the brain with behavior that we can observe. So the next question we had is, is this actual causal? And to find this out, we uh, recruit to optogenetics, with this, uh, it's, which is this other very cool technique um, from systems neuroscience. So basically, optogenetics, and um, we used a mouse that expressed channel rhodopsin in all axons that uh, came from dopaminergic neurons. And so channel rhodopsin is this other amazing engineered protein that whenever it is stimulated with light, whenever you shine a light on it, it opens a channel and that leads to depolarization of the, of the, of the neuron. And hence in our case, because this was expressed in dopamine neurons to dopamine release. And this is just to show from a different paper that indeed, if you do this and then stimulate these neurons with a laser pulse, it leads to very nice dopamine release. So we now focus on the tail of the stratum because we found that was more interesting because it was this seem to encode these more perceptual aspects of expectations. And when we now stimulated dopamine in this region, we could indeed increase dopamine uh, false alarm rate here. And we also saw that um, false alarm confidence increased in parallel. And what was really um, nice was that this was rescued by the antipsychotic and dopamine antagonist haloperidol. So when we um, repeated this experiment after vehicle as shown here, we could indeed um, again increase hallucination-like perception. When we pre-treated mice with haloperidol, as shown here, this effect was no longer present. So just to summarize, I first showed you a computational model that gave us a theoretical idea and showed that expectations can link dopamine and hallucination-like perceptions on an algorithmic level. I then sh um, showed you some fiber photometry data that suggests that elevated striatal dopamine in this um, leads, uh, precedes hallucination-like perception. And this was true for both of these regions, although our model suggested that in one region, dopamine reflected more reward-related expectations, whereas in the other region, in the tail of the striatum, dopamine reflected more perceptual expectations. And finally, I showed you some uh, causal evidence for a role of dopamine in this uh, hallucination-like perception um, with our optogenetics data, where we find that if we stimulate dopamine, this leads to more hallucination-like perception, and that is rescued by an antipsychotic drug um, that also blocks dopamine. So where, um, what can we learn from this? And I think the first take-home message um, here is, I think what is, we think now when we try to put this all together in a bigger model of hallucinations, what might be going on? So we know that dopamine in the striatum modulates the integration from inputs from the cortex with inputs from the um, thalamus. And we think that maybe the thalamic inputs might carry some sensory information and the cortical inputs might carry some information about expectation. And now when dopamine um, is off, it might bias this integration for whatever reason towards these cortical inputs. And now this integration is biased towards expectations and that is now how hallucinations emerge, basically through relying more strongly on expectations rather than on the sensory input. And this explains why suddenly um, people perceive things that are not there, but that they might just be expecting to perceive. So we think that this encoding of expectations might provide an algorithmic link for this biological observation of um, that dopamine relates to hallucinations. And I think the even larger, at least practical implication of our work is that what I think is really exciting about this is that we now have a framework to approach psychosis and I think in general also other psychiatric um, synd syndromes. And we call this framework cross-species computational psychiatry. And the idea is very um, yeah, simple. The idea is basically if we assume that Psychiatric, oh, let's, let's go take one step back even. If we assume that subjective experience has a correlate in a neural circuit 
And if we now assume that dysfunctional subjective experience in the form of psychiatric symptoms has a correlate in an impaired neural circuit, um, we can think that these neural circuit alterations might be similar in mice and in uh, humans. However, only in humans, we can actually assess the subjective side of these things. But now, if we think that neural circuits instantiate mental computations um, that we can access through very detailed uh, or very um, tailored tasks, such as our task for hallucination-like perception, um, then we also expect that this impairment in the neural circuitry will lead to altered behavior. And we can measure this behavior in humans and relate it to the subjective experience. And then we can go back to mice uh, and measure the behavior there and thereby make inferences, because we have all the tools in mice, about the underlying neural circuit impairment. Um, and I think this is basically what um, we are currently using in our lab to now go beyond dopamine. And you might ask, yeah, I was in the beginning, I was um, telling you that we haven't made a lot of pro uh, progress in treatments for psychosis and that I was very frustrated by this. So you might ask why, uh, what does this insight of, uh, why did you study dopamine if we already have drugs that do target dopamine? How does that help with new treatments? And you're right. Um, but the problem with the drugs that we have is that they do target dopamine, but not in a good way. And here's why. So we think that psychosis is caused by an increased dopamine release, basically too much dopamine in the synaptic tract. Now, antipsychotic drugs block the receptors here, the transmission on the postsynaptic side. This has the effect that this cell gets less dopamine stimulation, and we know, or at least there is some compelling evidence that suggests that as a, in response to that, the cell now starts to upregulate dopamine receptor number and also to express more sensitive dopamine receptors. And now basically we have two problems. We have too much dopamine in the synaptic cleft, but we also have an oversensitive dopamine receptive system. And what we observe very often in the clinic is that people with psychosis, that medications don't work in the long term. And very uh, one particular problem is that if people stop taking their medic so um, stop taking their medication they get what we call rebound psychosis which are psychotic episodes that are often worse than the initial psychosis and this is a very good um, potential biological explanation for this so what we need to do what the ideal antipsychotic drug would look like basically it would target the root cause which is this dopamine release and somehow decrease dopamine release in the first place now um with our framework, we have a handle on this, and that's exactly what we're doing right now. We look at upstream neuronal populations um, that modulate dopamine. For example, one population that we have started looking at is uh, cholinergic interneurons. These are really cool um, neurons in the striatum. They are very sparse, but what is truly amazing about them is although they are so sparse, I think it's less than 1% of the neurons in the striatum, they release huge amounts of acetylcholine, making the striatum, the, the place in the body that is densest in uh, acetylcholine. So it's pretty remarkable what they are, what they are achieving, um, also in terms of metabolic activity and so on. And um, interestingly enough, so there is some evidence from um, uh, pharmacological studies showing that, for example, drugs that um, decrease acetylcholine, they lead to hallucinations, very vivid hallucinations. And on the other hand, there is some emerging evidence that's quite fresh and really um, rapidly developing that suggests that cholinergic agonists or uh, allosteric modulators can be used, might be used as antipsychotics. There's just a phase three trial ongoing, and it's uh, very, very promising results from the early um, trials um, that suggest that a muscarinic agonist can actually um, yeah, have some uh, antipsychotic effects. So in any case, uh, we think these are really interesting neurons to look at. And um, so what we can do now with our framework is just um, use very similar approaches and measure acetylcholine and dopamine at the same time and understand how they relate to each other. And then we can think about using molecular tools to then dissect um, these uh, neurons and um, look for new treatment targets on them. OK, so this is kind of um, with all concerned uh, or surrounding um, the idea of how can we measure psychosis in rodents. Now, in the beginning, I said that another big challenge is how can we actually induce psychosis in rodents? And of course, we can use drugs such as ketamine or stimulate dopamine. Um, but 
we don't really know whether this reflects like a, 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 a physiological state that we find in people. And so what we would like to do is to kind of model something that we actually do find in people. And here the challenge is, it's not that we don't know what causes psychosis, it's almost the opposite. We know too much about the causes of psychosis. And we have identified a vast uh, amount of um, factors that do increase the risk for psychosis. For example, we know a lot about different environmental factors that um, can increase the risk for psychosis. There have been GWAS analysis that have shown, um, have identified many common genetic variants that do increase the risk for psychosis. But the problem with both of these um, causes is that they only increase the risk for psychosis by a very, very tiny um, amount. So, um, for example, I think most of the factors have maximally an odds ratio of two. That means instead of one out of um, a thousand, uh, one out of a hundred uh, uh, persons getting uh, psychosis, it's now two out of a hundred. And of course, if we want to model that in mice, it's not a really viable approach because we would need lots and lots of mice to actually get a few of these mice um, into a state of psychosis. But um, recent, very recent studies have then also identified more rare genetic variants that have a higher penetrance, so increase the risk for psychosis um, to a much higher degree. Um, the problem with these variants is that they are associated with very complex phenotypes. So it's not only psychosis, it's also all other sorts of uh, problems. Um, but that might be even fine. But the, the bigger problem is that even in these, in these uh, models, even if we were successfully to translate that into mice, we would not really know when to look for psychosis because these genetic variations are present from birth, but psychosis starts sometime in life. So we would not really know when to look in mice and it would be very tedi tedious experiments to find out which mice actually get psychosis and at what time. Um, so, I mean, I think it's a very uh, worthwhile um, uh, avenue to explore, but I think um, for us, it seems like that it might be still a little um, slow and um, difficult to get a consistent phenotype. So, what would be the solution to overcome such a uh, the challenges of a multifactorial disease? And of course, one solution is to model the causal common causal endpoint where all of these factors um, converge. And I want to make the argument that this one of the common causal endpoints um, before the brain, which is obviously the ultimate common causal endpoint, but before the brain, um, might be an immune process targeting the brain. And here is why I think this might be the case. We know that um, there's a lot of evidence that suggests an um, immune dysregulation in psychosis. For example, some of the genetic variants that I showed you that are uh, involved in psychosis actually are, related, uh, are located in immune-related genes. We also know that people with psychosis have an increased risk for autoimmune disease and the other way around. We know that previous infections, and interestingly, both prenatally, but also postnatally in childhood, but even later in adulthood, um, increase the risk for psychosis. And this, for example, has been most recently shown with uh, COVID, where a, a small uh, amount of people, but just to illustrate the, 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 the point that I'm trying to make, a, a very small amount of people with, uh, can, um, has been observed to uh, become severe psychotic symptoms after a few weeks after COVID uh, infection. And this is actually something that has been known for a while that severe infection in some cases, rare cases, can trigger psychosis. So just to show that there might be a link. Um, there are lots of studies showing cytokine um, alterations in the blood, but also in the cerebrospinal fluid of psychosis patients. And interestingly, um, there is a link between autoantibodies um, targeting the brain and psychosis. And this is most um, or best illustrated with a case of autoimmune anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. Um, so if you're interested in, this, uh, in, this, in the phenomenology of this condition, I can highly recommend this book, which is a memoir by a journalist who um, actually um, experienced this condition. And so this, this disease or condition is caused by antibodies that target the NMDA receptor in the brain. And interestingly enough, it typically starts with psychotic symptoms that look exactly like schizophrenia, and only later patients progress into a more severe um, phenotype with seizures and so on, where they need to go to the uh, ICU and um, get some uh, life-sustaining support. But this just is another kind of proof that in principle, brain autoantibodies can cause psychosis. Um, 
And we also know from um, post-mortem studies um, that at least in some patients, we find lymphocyte infiltrations in the, brain, in the brain, and some sequencing studies have found an upregulation of immune-related related genes. Um, and one, I just think it's a fascinating idea that has not received um, enough attention over the years. We know that all the immune cells, lymph, all the lymphocytes, macrophages, all the immune cells, they carry functional neurotransmitter receptor, and especially dopamine and serotonin receptors, which are the main targets of antipsychotic drugs. Um, and we know, um, for example, from the antipsychotic drug clozapine, which is the, the most efficient antipsychotic um, that we have at our hands, that clozapine leads to, we see that in patients, that it leads to an immune, uh, to an immunoglobulin um, deficiency, so to a downregulation of antibodies. Um, and it might we, we could speculate that maybe that um, contributes to its therapeutic effect. So if we think that maybe some patients have an autoimmune disease where autoantibodies target the brain, now clozapine downregulates antibodies, and that might be why they get better. Um, and this has some evidence from mouse models where um, mouse models of uh, multiple sclerosis or experimental autoimmune encephalitis, when they're treated with um, clozapine, um, people see that this partially reverses their brain inflammation. So just another case in point that um, there is an involvement of the uh, immune system in psychosis. And I think what is most fascinating, but also the weakest evidence, so take it with a grain of salt because it's case reports, but it's still, I will explain it because I think it is really, really intriguing. Um, there are at least three case reports that suggest that maybe psychosis can be transmitted via stem cell transplant. A stem cell transplant is um, basically um, the exchange of one's immune system with another person's immune system. And there is one case report from a person uh, who had schizophrenia, treatment resistant, nothing helped. And then this person, for better or worse, also developed a hematological condition, a leukemia, and needed a stem cell transplant. And once the person had received the new stem cells from another person without schizophrenia, not only did his hematological um, condition uh, remit, but also his schizophrenia symptoms disappeared. Um, and this is even more intriguing together with another case, which is the opposite, where a person without schizophrenia needed a stem cell transplant. The only available donor was a person with schizophrenia. So, and because it was a life-threatening condition, the, the doctors decided to go forward and um, tr uh, transplant the stem cells from the schizophrenia person to the non-schizophrenia person. And what happened is that this person after the stem cell transplant got symptoms that looked very similar um, to schizophrenia and to psychosis. So what this suggests is that the immune system might harbor the cause of schizophrenia or of psychosis, um, at least in some patients. Um, and so this is the kind of um, the basis for some of our other work that we're currently doing. And so what we're doing is we go into um, people and we, um, uh, we recruit people with psychosis and collect um, cerebral spinal fluid from them, which is something that um, I think is not being done enough. Um, so the cerebral spinal fluid is important because the brain is an immune privileged organ and to really gain access in, to the immune compartment that is uh, relevant for the brain, we need cerebral spinal fluid. Um, and then we can um, do some advanced immune um, methods to find out what the immune processes are that are ongoing. And then I think what is very exciting and what now is possible through our way of being able to measure hallucination like perception mice, we can then try to transplant the processes we find in humans into mice. And the things that we're currently exploring are, so for example, we can use um, active immunization. So if we know what antigens might be involved, for example, NMDA, we can come up with protocols where we immunize mice against NMDA and then see whether they develop um, phenotypes, or we can do some passive transfer experiments where we um, yeah, uh, transfer these um, antibodies. And so I just want to end on a kind of very hopeful and optimistic note, because I think um, that psychiatry has never been in a more, um, yeah, in a better place for making progress in the next decade. I think um, what I showed you today is that there are nowadays some ways to measure psychosis and potentially also other psychiatric syndromes in mice. Um, and I explained to you our framework of hallucination like perception for that. And I think we also get to, will get to a place where we can reliably induce psychosis in rodents and then look at the causal mechanisms and by using the insights from, uh, that we gain from uh, brain directed immunity. And so what I hope um, that we will see in uh, 2052, I uh, should have updated it, 2053, but I think in, in 
30 uh, years from now, I hope that we will that our work will have contributed to um, a situation where we will have circuit based treatment, for example, some treatments that are target psychosis relevant neuronal populations upstream of dopamine, and where we also will be in a place where we actually can directly target the immune processes that are um, go awry in psychosis and basically get a more causal uh, to a place where we have a more causal treatment available for psychosis. And with that, I would like to um, thank you for your attention. Um, I would like to thank Adam Kapish um, and uh, his lab, my colleagues from his lab um, in Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, where I did all this work on hallucination-like perception. Uh, and this is our psychosis collective at the Francis Crick Institute in uh, Berlin, who, uh, Berlin, sorry, <laughs> in London, um, who, uh, yeah, have uh, started to work with me on these challenges. And um, yeah, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Katarina. <laughs> this was an amazing talk. Um, I, I actually learned a lot. So I, I would like to ask you the first question maybe before we get, go to the, to the audience's question. So during these psychotic episodes, do you actually observe activity in the sensory vortices? So, when they report they hear something, it, there is actually something there. So uh, these circuits actually do get activated as if they are hungry for some kind of reward. Yes, I will have some answers in maybe two years. <laughs> we are currently starting to record an auditory cortex to find out what what is going on in auditory cortex. Studies from humans. There are studies from um, fMRI studies from humans that do symptom capture, um, and also some studies that do similar tasks and. What they find is that indeed there are some clusters of activations that extend to auditory cortex. They also extend into the insula and into prefrontal cortex. So I'm I'm not 100% sure whether we will really find something in auditory cortex. Uh, maybe it is all driven by prefrontal cortex, but um, I think we will find that out in the coming years. Nice. Hopefully. <laughs> Um, should I read the first question from the Q&A section? We seem to have a lot of questions going on. So there's a lot of interest in what you said, Katarina. That's so great. one attendee is asking, even though several research show that there are inputs from sensory cortex, for example, auditory cortex to the tail striatum, as far as I know, there is less evidence about outputs from the tail striatum to the sensory areas. Do you have any evidence that increased dopamine in the TS caused increases activation of auditory cortex or language areas? Pernikes or Broca? Great question. No, I, I, we don't have any evidence. And if there is a feedback, it, it would be through the output, um, uh, through the general outputs of the striatum. So the striatal thalamic cortical loops. So yeah, I agree. Um, it's probably not a direct feedback onto the auditory cortex or any cortex. Um, it's mediated through the striatal output areas, if there is any. <laughs> Okay, thank okay. You. the next question is a quick question. Is there a cue that signals the start of a trial? And second, is there a relationship between the rate of false alarm and the rate of high confidence misses? Um, okay, so the first question, yes, there are cues. So there's a cue, there's not really a cue, but the mouse initiates the trial. So there's a clear kind of, the mouse knows when the trial starts, but then there's also a cue, um, the mouse also knows when it should expect the signal. Um, that is important because otherwise it would not know, and we would not know when to look actually for, for the responses when there's no signal. So it's cued. Um, and the second question, um, relationship before the false alarm and the right of, um, so yes, um, and these relationships um, are perfectly captured by our confidence model. They are um, more complex and then they it's it's hard they, they are not like directly predicted by intuition and um, but our confidence model perfectly uh, predicts that and uh, this is what i showed at, at some point like these confidence ratios so um depending on what the perception looks like we see that these both change uh, in certain directions um, and we can predict that perfectly with our model thank you Okay, the next question is, what would be the cause of this the dopamine increase uh, in trials with hallucination-like perceptions? I think they're talking about the dopamine increase prior to the stimulus. Yes, that's a great question. And I think uh, that one possibility is that it's natural fluctuations and just 
right. without any without any cost. But I think what we claim from our modeling data is basically that um, dopamine is increased because it constantly reflects the expectation of hearing a trial. And this expectation is basically the product of all previous experience. Uh, it's most strongly um, influenced by the last trial. So basically, depending on what happened in the last trial, dopamine would be higher or lower, depending on what the current expectation is. But it's probably both, I would say. I mean, we, we don't see like a perfect um, capture. We see that dopamine represents some of these expectations, but probably there's also some noise ongoing, and we don't know whether on top of that there might be some fluctuations. It would be We've been thinking about some closed loop experiments. It would be really nice where we can measure and uh, monitor dopamine fluctuations and then see if we present a stimulus at the time point where the dopamine is really high, whether this actually leads to more um, hallucination-like perceptions. A great question. <laughs> okay. Okay, the next question is, um, between a, for example, hallucinogen-induced brief psychotic disorder and the psychotic episode within a schizophrenia, uh, is there evidence in how and whether the hallucinations are similar or differ in dopamine activity? Um, I think there's actually not a lot of evidence. So I think there's the only evidence we have from neuroimaging data is um, evidence from people with a diagnosed psychotic episode, um, which is not necessarily schizophrenia, but then um, usually, I mean, I think it's hard to tell from these studies because I, there's no longitudinal data, but I would suspect that most of these patients probably had a more schizophrenia-like syndrome um, because usually people exclude people who have substance abuse. Um, and I'm not aware of any studies that have looked particularly in substance-induced um, disorders. Would be a very interesting question. And of course, there is in general the possibility that this dopamine mechanism might only hold true in some patients. And maybe that explains why some patients just don't respond to dopamine antagonists. Um, and that's also one of the motivations why looking at other cell populations might make sense, because maybe at some point we can stratify patients and can find out it's just a subgroup of patients who has a problem with dopamine. Other patients might have a job problem with acetylcholine. And if we can find out which patients are which, we can tailor the treatment to them. So yeah, it's uh, it's currently, I think, unknown, but um, great question. Thank you. Uh, we have a question that is uh, a little bit cryptic for me, at least. Uh, doesn't it make sense that having more signals leads to higher confidence that signals are there? So basically, did you not expect... Yeah. We have this yes. between confidence and yeah. Yes, no, we, we would expect it and was reassuring to see it that um I I, I agree it's not surprising. Um, but it's good to to prove it. I, I think to just make sure that we are actually observing what we are thinking to observe. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question is dopamine levels in ventral striatum was high for false alarm but low for mist. How do you suppose this figures in the complete model for hallucination-like perception? Is it possible that this accounts for those uh, high confidence false alarms, which are just because the mouse messed up perception notwithstanding? Um, so I guess it's a general question from our results, like how do we reconcile also the findings in the ventral stratum with the findings in the tail of the stratum, because they both go on at the same time. So. Um, I, I, I don't really know, um, and I, uh, I've been thinking about that, so it's possible that maybe the ventral stratum is not really relevant for this perception, but who knows? Um, we haven't really done any experiments to test what the causal involvement of the ventral stratum is. Um, so I think the tail of the stratum makes a lot of sense in our model, but I don't have a good model for the ventral stratum. We kind of just <laughs> ignored it, and I, uh, I don't really know how it relates to the, to the other findings. Thank you. Thank you. So now another question says, when general adoption dopamine mice get stimulated, do they get psychotic after a number of trials? And if yes, how many? Uh, I oof, I haven't looked at this in detail and it's I'm not sure we have the right resolution for that. Uh, the reason is it's just very, uh, very complicated long experiments where we don't have a lot of trials. So the false alarms are only 15% of the trials. And then if we stimulate on 20% of the trials, then you can kind of make the math, <laughs> do the math. It's just, I, I think we would need a lot and a lot of mice to, to address this question, but I would almost suspect so. I don't know, um, but I, my feeling is that it might be some kind of sensitization going on. 
Um, and I'm also suspecting something similar with ketamine. I, I, we didn't see it in the data, but we do these experiments over prolonged um, intervals of time because it is so difficult to get trials. Um, so I, my suspicion is that there needs to be some sensitization, but yeah, we need to look into that in more detail. I, I have a personal question that is a little bit related to this, and I'm yes. using the opportunity to put it. I wonder if you use the anti-hallucinogenic drugs or the schizophrenic drugs uh, on the models that are healthy and seeing a decrease in, uh, in psychosis yes. and in, do in dopamine levels. A great question. So we didn't look at dopamine levels, but what we do not see an effect of, so we see an unspecific effect on behavior it's in one of the graphs. So basically what we see is that haloperidol together with vehicle where there's, uh, together with no stimulation, we mm -hmm. see that haloperidol decreases like um, only the confidence, I think, um, or increases it because they become a little slower, but we don't see any, any effects at baseline, which I think is a very important take home message for planning experiments on these states. Um, I think in general, we always need to think like there, there are always non-linearities. So I think, um, and for antipsychotic drugs, this has been known in the clinic, or is at least like textbook knowledge from the clinic that um, they don't, they are not supposed to have an effect on non-psychotic individuals, but they only are supposed to have an effect on psychotic individuals. And our data is in line with that. So when looking at these mechanisms for any kind of state, it's always important to consider what is the state that we are actually targeting for, um, because we might only find the effects we're expecting in these uh, baseline states. And sorry, and on the ketamine mice, did you try that? We did not try that, no, um, something on the list. Um, there's a, quite a debate ongoing whether antipsychotics reverse ketamine-induced um, uh, 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 psychotic experiences or not, because there was one paper that said that it doesn't have an effect, but then a negative finding is not proof enough. I would yeah. suspect it does, but um, we have to do the experiment. Thank you. Okay, the next question also from Razvan. Is serotonin disturbed during psychosis and <laughs> at what level? Um, so I'm not sure about the imaging data. So antipsychotic drugs, most of them also target serotonin, especially the 5-HT2A receptor. Um, and we also know that psychedelics are supposed to work through this receptor. So there is kind of a, some, uh, some evidence for an involvement of serotonin. Um, I think imaging serotonin has been a little more challenging as opposed to imaging dopamine. So I'm not sure whether, so I'm not aware of any um, established evidence that serotonin release, for example, is, uh, is changed in psychosis, but um, it's not, impossible. So I think there's room. Uh, this hypothesis has not been discarded. Thank you. Uh, now we have a question from uh, Hong Kong from Dr. Ula Atta. Uh, he says, thank you for the wonderful talk. I ha have a very general question. You know, there is no specific animal model for schizophrenia yet. And your model seems very interesting. I wonder if other people want to replicate or use your model as a template. So how they can find such a paradigm? I mean, is it available to purchase or how to make it? Um, so um, hopefully from the, <laughs> so I know other labs have independently of us without our help um, replicated it. Um, so hopefully from the from the paper, there's enough evidence, uh, enough information for uh, for doing it. And the, the, the setup is, um, can be purchased from Sunworks, uh, which is the B-Pod company that we're using. Um, so that's what the other lab has done. Um, so yeah, uh, this is the way I would, uh, I think the challenge is it's really not high throughput. So um, I just want to, it's a very good model for looking at the neural circuitry. I'm not sure it's a good model for, for example, for um, high throughput screening because it takes like three months to, to, to train the mice um, and it's very finicky. It's not, um, not a kind of large scale drug discovery model, I would say, but who knows? I mean, if someone is motivated to, to um, roll it out large scale, um, we're always happy to to help. So just get in touch if there's anything we can help with. Thank you. Okay. The next question is: What triggers receptor sensitization? Is it the density of dopamine molecules in the synaptic cleft? Great question. I don't know whether this is known, um, and I don't know how exactly that is supposed to be happening. Uh, I would assume it's some post um, uh, translation, uh, some, some signaling um, in the cell that then leads to some modifications of gene expression, but I, I, I don't know and I, I don't know whether this is known, um, but very interesting question, a very relevant question. Thank you. 
And now we have reached our last question by Harald. Aside from ketamine, did you consider using other classes of hallucinogens? Ketamine is an NMDA receptor antagonist, but there are other hallucinogens that produce their effects by interacting with other receptors, LSD, DMT, and serotonin receptors. Would you expect the results to be similar? Great question. I don't know. Um, I know that some people are working on this, um, not, not us, but some other people. Um, I, I would be very curious to see, for example, with LSD, whether it also induces these auditory hallucinations or maybe we would need a visual version of the task because I think that's what's, uh, what is more um, uh, observed in, in the kind of hallucinations people get from these drugs um, to be found out. I, I think we will learn that in the coming years. Great. Thank you very much, Katarina. Yeah. Thank you. End of our questions, and we would like to thank you for your talk. It was highly interesting and very engaging for everybody, it seems. And thank you for all the audience for being here and listening to all of this. Um, we invite you again, I think, uh, maybe mm, later in the summer. We don't have a scheduled session yet, but please join our newsletter to, um, to keep uh, track of our seminars. And we hope to see you soon, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the questions. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. All the best. Bye-bye.